Hi, in this edition of the Engineer's Bench, we're going to talk about power distribution units, uh, those kind of one use strips that you see at the top of equipment cabinets, which provide equipment to all the, the, the mains powered equipment in the cabinet. Um, traditionally, these have just been reasonably passive devices where you've got a single supply comes in, gets split, gets sent through a load of fuses, and there might be an isolation switch for the whole uh, distribution, but um, not much goes on after that. In the last few years, though, several manufacturers have produced um, units that, uh, that are intelligently controllable and monitorable over the network. So they'll have an Ethernet jack on the back and either with a web browser or with some other network protocol you can go in there and, and, and see you know, how much current's being dragged by each circuit, whether a fuse has blown um, and uh, uh, you know the, the overall current consumption, those kind of things, temperature even. And of course they're a lot more expensive uh, but um, you know in critical environments where you know you can't lose your shared storage or you know servers have to remain up or need to be remotely repairable these things are just the business. So Bright Broadcast, who are my favourite manufacturers of all that kind of stuff, and uh, you know, if you look at their their passive um, kind of old school PDUs, which we're going to look at in a minute, um, I've probably installed a thousand of those over the last ten years. Um, but but they've recently produced a line of of, of network. Um, uh, intelligent PDUs as they call them and I'm very pleased that we're going to be talking to Simon Quill their technical director today old friend uh, old drinking buddy from uh, IBC and uh, uh, he'll be telling us a lot more about it but uh, we're just going to have a little bit of a, a look inside one of the old units now and, and, and just a little bit of a look at the outside of the new unit this is a, uh, a regular PDU of the kind we use in a lot of our, our mains installations. Typically an equipment cabinet will have one or maybe two of these at the top of the rack. And it is, after all, just a mains distribution unit, but the way it differs from your regular kind of four-way um, uh, you know, 13 amp uh, plug board is uh, it, it's, it's, it's a much more expensive piece of course this is about £200 for one of these power distribution units but it's also built to a much higher specification it's, you've got a, a neon lighting up switch that isolates the whole strip and then obviously each circuit has a all 14 circuits have a fuse um, typically they come shipped with, um, with T3.15 amp uh, fuses but you can put up to 10 amps per circuit although obviously you couldn't draw 140 amps through the whole board but that would be ridiculous but but and then each circuit as well has uh, has an LED to indicate if the fuse has blown so you know if this is in the top of a cabinet and uh, and you've got a piece of equipment that's out in the cabinet obviously you can see immediately uh, which of the circuits is out uh, because because uh, the, the lights come on and if you take a look around the back here um, you know it's a bit different from a regular uh, power distribution strip because we've got we've got this rather handy lacing bar uh, so, so the wireman, when they're, when, they're, when they're lacing these cables into the cabinet, can, can nicely dress the cables onto the bar so that things don't get accidentally pulled out, etc. And we've got the, you can see the 14 IEC outlets. These are 10 amp IEC connectors, as we call them in broadcast. The, the, the designation for them is a, is, a, is a C13 connector, and this is a 10 amp connector. And then obviously you've got your, uh, you've got your inlet here, which is a deriggable connector, and that's important. So in this case it's a, it's a power con, which is a 20 amp connector, and... Uh, it's a locking connector as well, so it doesn't easily pull out. And, and of course, as well, uh, because you know we're, we're, we're very obsessed with earth safety and, 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 and the security of the safety earth, uh, that there's uh, an earthing tag on here. Which, if we, so if we if we bust open this one, it's not powered, of course. The connector's not there. Um, uh, then you can see kind of how the, uh, the, the the innards are wired, and immediately you're struck uh, by the fact that it's all all sort of wired either on crimp connectors or on solder tags. There's no there's no sort of like mains current going down PCB tracks, which you do see in in more budget versions of this from other manufacturers. But uh, the thing that strikes you is this is obviously a, a hand built um, piece uh, because everything is either crimped uh, uh, on, on 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 lug connectors or it's soldered. And, and you can see the bus bars for all the connectors here. Uh, of course, the, uh, the the neutral and the earth are on a bus bar, but all, all all the all the live circuits are, as we said before, individually fused. And then there's just a little um, uh, a PCB here with the LEDs soldered onto it, and uh, you know, you, you, the, the, with um, with just with um, current shut resistors uh, that they, they they sense whether the circuit whether whether the resist whether the fuse has blown and um, and, and the LED comes on uh, as there's a potential difference uh, derived across it as a consequence. Um, 
getting back to earthing, it's worth noticing that um, as well as obviously the earth that comes in on the mains connector, there's, there's an earthing lug as well, which, you know, being a, a, a properly made metal box, all these earths are connected together internally to a star point. And in fact, even the deriggable uh, top lid, uh, you know, has an earthing strap on it. So even though the lid, when bolted into the main unit, um, is electrically... Um, not isolated. It's it, you know there's a path of conduction. The point is that it's all belt and braces. There's always multiple paths back to earth. And if this is in a cabinet um, uh, where you've got multiple pieces of equipment, uh, we would have run earthing straps from the main earth distribution unit to the cabinet. So the metalwork of the cabinets is all at earth potential. Um, so that any equipment bolted into those cabinets, the chassis of that equipment is also at earth potential. Of course, that equipment is also getting an earth by virtue of the fact that this is a three pin. Uh, you know, earth connector that's bringing its mains in, and so a mains earth has also come in via the 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 uh, the, 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 um, the power con connector, and we tie this as well to the cabinet earth. So so whichever way you look at it, there's kind of three ways back to earth. So so no single point of failure can potentially cause a situation where a faulty piece of equipment, where its metal chassis has gone live, could wind up killing somebody. And this is the difference between you know, a domestic piece of, uh, of, of mains distribution, which is invariably in a plastic box, uh, you know, has, has no sort of um, uh, proper earthing consideration. And although that complies with the Class 2 standard, uh, it wouldn't do for broadcast. We'd like everything to be multiply earthed, multiple routes back to uh, ground. And that's why a piece like this is a £200 mains distribution board Whereas functionally, it does exactly the same thing as your £10 uh, mains distribution block that you bought from your DIY superstore. So if I simulate a fuse blowing just by releasing this fuse here. Oh, can I do it with one hand? There we go. So take the fuse out of its holder. And you can see we've got a red LED to indicate to the, uh, the engineer in the machine room that the fuse on that piece of equipment has gone. And there we go. Very, very hard to see, but that is a, a T uh, 3.15 amp uh, fuse. So, so, so a, um, a quick blow. Um, no, T, anti-surge. It's an anti-surge fuse, um, uh, and there's one of 10. Typically, they're each fused at 3 amps, but there's occasions when, for example, we're taking one circuit, and typically we use the last one in the cabinet to feed the UPS at the bottom of the cabinet. So maybe there's a, a bay mounted UPS which will feed with a 10 amp uh, feed out of the last circuit down to the UPS, and then a second one of these PDUs in the cabinet will be fed by the output of the UPS, and then We'll cable the bay with two different colours of mains cables. All the mains cables coming out of the top one typically will be orange uh, to indicate raw incoming mains. And then all the ones coming out of the second UPS will cable blue, blue for battery, so that you know that uh, you've got a battery backed and a, a raw incoming supply within the cabinet. And it's very easy to see by looking at the mains cables in the cabinet which one is which. So moving across to the other side of the Route 6 workshop, well, to our other set of wiring benches, our workshop's actually quite big, you can see all our sort of storage area over here, and then through the glass there is the, uh, the office where, uh, where, where we sit and do all our design work. But uh, moving over to, uh, to, to this other PDU that I've got on the bench over here, again, this is manufactured by the same company, this is Bright Broadcast, and um, this one is kind of a step up again, this is, is what they call an intelligent PDU, and again, it's the same, you'll notice the same thing, 14 individually fused uh, circuits, and there's a main also supply uh, fuse as well. And the reason for this is that this is um, a lot more intelligence than this. So if I turn the unit on, press the button there, the first thing you'll notice is the circuits liven up, not all at once, but in a stepped fashion. In fact, this is entirely controllable by software. You can set up a macro to do that. And as well, you'll also notice the little, the little OLED display that's come on that uh, allows us to uh, to look at various aspects of the of the machine. There's uh, that's uh, the main supply, and you can see that uh, this we're currently dragging just over an amp at 240 odd volts through this thing. Um, so let's go back home, um, internal temperature, and we can reset the Ethernet interface, which should tell you something. Back home and have a look at the output, and we can step through the, the, the outputs and see how much each output is dragging. So currently the first output, which we haven't given a name to yet, but actually we can in software, um, is dragging uh, uh, just shy of an amp. Uh, bit more than 100 milliamps, a uh, quarter of an amp, and uh, I think there's nothing else connected, and it tells us that by no load. So let's go back home. Very much the same around the back of the PDU. 
um, the same uh, power con input, the same earthing tag, the same lacing bar, except there's also an ethernet connector on the back here. Can we see that? Let's just move the camera there. There's an ethernet connector on the back there, and this is where the magic happens. So, as I said, um, uh, this is an intelligent PDE. I've got a couple of things connected to at the moment. Um, my colleague Matt was testing uh, some uh, editing workstations. There's a Hewlett Packard 8400 and a Mac Pro. In fact, we'll just start the Mac Pro up. So that'll give us something to work on when we go and look at the web interface. So we've pointed at our web browser at the, the IP address of the... Um of the power distribution unit, and we won't kind of you know spend too much time uh, thinking about that because obviously networks are networks. But suffice to say, this thing initially uh, looks for a DHCP server, and uh, and then it's quite easy uh, to tell the um, IP address of it. In fact, Bryant do a rather splendid little utility which I will just run um, to, so we can see what it looks like, um, and that is. Uh, where are you? OS ten downloads inside there. So, so this is their little utility, and it's just told me that uh, there's there's an iPower sitting on that IP address. And so, if I go back to my web browser, and and uh, and in fact it was another IP address, wasn't it? Um, Two eleven. It's an iPower device. Lovely. And and there we are. So if I'll I'll, I'll just renew that web page just so that you're convinced and that uh, um, we're, we're seeing several things here there's a real-time measurement of, of voltage uh, and in fact this is a real waveform apparently and uh, Simon will be telling us more about how that's sampled and presented later but the blue waveform is the is the, the incoming mains voltage and the uh, the red waveform is the current and you can see that uh, <laughs> you know, this is the effect of, of sort of non-linearity in the power supplies of, of equipment. Um, you know, if this was an entirely resistive load, we'd expect the currents and the voltage to track each other exactly, and, and there to be no phase difference. But uh, uh, we can see that the current is doing some very strange things, and that's probably to do to do with the harmonics that switch mode supplies are dumping back out onto the mains, and the fact that the current is leading the voltage. Uh, should tell us that this looks like a capacitive load, which doesn't make sense to me, but anyway, there you go. And in fact, if we look around the interface, we can see at the moment we're looking at a total graph, so the, 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 the entire main supply consumed by the whole unit. I can, I can, uh, I can click through individual circuits, so if I, if I, if I click on that one, and uh, um, once it's sampled, it's showing us exactly what's on that first circuit, which uh, from that previous little clip we saw is currently a Hewlett-Packard um, workstation, um, dragging nearly an amp, you know, it's a big beefy industrial computer, um, so you'd expect it. We could turn it off from here, or we can we can rename the the outlet, uh, or we can go and look at the other things that are on there. So that's a a Mac Pro, another uh, reasonably beefy uh, workstation, dragging three quarters of an amp, and and then that last one is the LCD monitor that that's, that, that the two are being displayed on. And in fact, look at that, that's a very funny waveform there for the current. Um, I can only imagine how the power supply inside that monitor is configured. Clearly, uh, it's, it, 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 the main switching transistor in the switch mode supply is only switching in when, uh, when the voltage hits a, a limit, uh, it's charging, and, uh, and, and then only needs to be on for a certain amount of time. Obviously, if that supply was being more heavily taxed, we'd see a, a, a greater tracking of current with voltage, but uh, that's a, a kind of a very funny uh, waveform you wouldn't expect to see. Um, the other thing that's worth noting is that look at this, the, the, the mains, as in most cities nowadays, it has got sort of flat top to it. You don't see sine wave mains anymore. And, uh, and that's just reflective of the fact there are so many switch mode power supplies uh, which are only loading the mains as they hit the top of the cycle. And so, and so that's why uh, mains is rarely a sine wave anymore. It's, it's very kind of flat topped. And in fact, in some particularly badly filtered switching supplies, you often see... Um, even hoarder harmonics starting to uh, to put a bit of a square edge onto the rise and fall time of the, of the sine wave as well. But if we go to a uh, a circuit that isn't in use, we can see that there's nothing on this circuit whatsoever, um, and, uh, and and no current, no, no no power being dragged. Uh, and we've got a very strange effect here. What's going on here? We can see that the voltage in blue, uh, but uh, this this what looks like noise is exactly what it is. Clearly, this is that the, the, the A to D is just sampling the noise on that circuit. It, this must auto scale, and so we're literally seeing that the, the the most significant, the least significant bit amplified up to the nth degree, and we're just seeing noise on that circuit. Well, let's go back to a, uh, a a proper piece of equipment that's actually dragging power. There we go. Very typical. And we could turn that outlet off. Uh, and in fact, if the fuse fails, 
um, uh, it, it'll light up shirts. In fact, I'm just going to go and simulate a fuse failure by releasing a fuse. So there we go, outlet number six. I, uh, I released the fuse, and uh, of course it shows in the interface as being a fuse has blown. Another nice feature we can see here is, is that the main incoming supply in this sort of yellow panel here is, is, is showing us incoming voltage, which is very typical for London, a bit more than 240 volts. And our frequency is riding a tiny bit higher than, uh, than 50 hertz. In fact, Britain is a, is a unified supply across the whole country. Um, so, so, so this is exactly the same frequency that everybody in Britain will be seeing at the moment. Uh, law mandates that this has to be very, very close to 50 hertz um, in aggregate. And in fact, over a few minutes, this is exactly 50 hertz. But at the moment, we're riding a bit higher than 50 hertz. Now, obviously, when uh, the Emirates Stadium uh, turn on their lighting grid, and there's quite a significantly more amount of current being pulled. Uh, the whole of Britain, you know, all the generators momentarily slow down as they're loaded a tiny bit more, but of course the regulation in those uh, servos will bring that back up again. Uh, but at the moment we're riding a bit above 50 hertz. Often it's, it's a tiny bit below 50 hertz. Um, you know, mains is, 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 is an RMS system, you know, with 240 watts RMS. So we're seeing our peak voltage there. And uh, uh, Crest Factor and, and Earth Leakage, um, things like that. Uh, 3.5 milliamps is the, is the limit that you're allowed through uh, from from the input to the to the to, to the earth distribution strip, all the way to the to to the connector on the back of the piece of equipment. Obviously, if you've got lots of earth leakage, that impedes residual current detectors from being able to do their thing. And in fact, if I click on uh, earth leakage graph, we can get a, uh, a a graph of earth leakage. And again, the 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 earth leakage current seems to be leading the voltage. So hopefully, that's something Simon will be able to tell us a bit more about. We go back to the total graph, and uh, and see exactly what's coming through our system uh, and this is very powerful this is like having you know a whole 14 fluke um, mains analyzers built into your power distribution strip well as i say i mean there, there are there are a couple of things i can show yeah uh, there's we have a tcp configuration program uh, i shall connect to a unit so this, this is just demonstrating where you can set the ip address of the unit if it's DHCP on, oh, I'm not. I'm not actually sharing my screen at the moment, am I? So that's not really going to do much good. So let me just uh, disconnect that, minimise that, go back to turn that off. Uh, cool. Falling at the first fence. That's cool, isn't it? <laughs> right. Fantastic. So I can see you. So if I take you full screen, and um, that's good. Uh, you. Probably want to. I can see two of me, so you might want to. You might want to. Perhaps. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Get get rid of that. Perhaps. And still there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all looking good now, actually. So I, I can't see you at all now. So. Okay. <laughs> You'll okay. just have to take it as I red. I'm here. It, it? <laughs> so yeah. So first of all, there's a there's a program called iPower Discover, which is this one. If you click Discover Devices, it sends out a. Um, a message onto the local intranet. Um, it only happens on your on your local IP range. So that's that's, that's a multicast sh shout out, oh, is it? A multicast message, yeah. and basically any iPower unit that's attached to the network will return with its IP address, its NetBIOS name, and its MAC address. You can see here that the host name, the the Net the NetBIOS name, is editable. By default, it leaves us with iPower and the, and its serial number on the end. I've edited this one to be iPower demo. Right. So I know that my, this unit is on IP address 49 in my IP. So in my iPower TCP config program, I've filled in the address. It talks on port 1243, which you can change. Say connect. It's connected. Read the network settings. And this is now reading uh, okay. it out. So that's, that's suck the details out of that particular suck unit. The out yeah. of the unit. Um, you can select whether it's DHCP or not. You can set the IP address, subnet mask, all that normal stuff. You can set the net, the, the net BIOS name. You've also got these two fields, unit location, unit name. And, and, and they're just arbitrary strings, are they? Just for your well, edification. Arbitrary, yeah. arbitrary strings, but they get used later on. Right. You can disable TCP control, um, 
you can also set the units up using serial. If you don't want people to be able to control it over TCP, right. you can turn that off. So you're limiting it to serial programming um, for security if you, you know, want to. There's this security settings here for the web browser where you it's not implemented yet. There'll be a firmware update to do this. You'll be able to set a, a password, a username password to view the web browser interface a username and password to control the unit that's on the web browser interface, and then a username and password for admin, where you'll be able to set this sort of stuff up through the web browser interface. None, none of that's implemented. It's in the roadmap, to use a horrible word. <laughs> um, but um, So that will get there at some point. So um, quick, quick question on, on the network side of things, Simon. Um, uh, obviously, you've got the, the IP address and the port number there. Can, can you can you send a connection over a net router? So, so, so if you if you knew the IP address and you had a port open on a net router, can you can you get in from the the big bad internet to it? To oh, a absolutely. U- if, right, if, you've okay. opened, if you've opened a route to a unit that's in a remote building, right, then that's absolutely not a problem. It just you won't see it on the. Um, it won't the, discover it, of course. Yeah, because yeah. It's not it, not within your within your, within your C class network within your LAN. Yeah. Your, yes, indeed, yeah. absolutely. Um, I don't know whether I'm allowed to plug these things, but we sold a lot of these units now to uh, Telenor in Norway. Right. Um, there is one situated on the island of Svalbard. Fantastic. If you look it up in Google Maps, it's in the middle of the um, sea, north of the Arctic Circle. Um, and there isn't a lot on Svalbard other than an um, antenna farm and an airport and a few sheep, and I think that's about it. Um, so Just that's exactly what they do. They're, they're using... Um, Skyline's data miner um, control software um, to talk to it over TCP, and it's on the remote island, so they can remotely turn things on and off. I, I suppose that that's the power of something like this, isn't it? The fact that the that's, fact that you, yeah. you know you the number of times I've had people call me at the weekends when something just physically needs power cycling. You know what what a fantastic yeah. thing to be able to do that remotely. <laughs> Indeed. So I so say that's that's exactly why you can do that. It's one of the reasons this was all designed in the first place um what's the timeout um it's set, currently sets of three seconds what's that oh that's just for communications it, it, you know, if it doesn't get an answer back from the unit within three okay. seconds it's a timeout right. limit. if you've got a very late uh, a, a connection that's got high latency you can increase the timeout but yes. it's going to wait to before it complains about not having it had an answer the way the system works both on serial and over tcp is you send it a command one of the first things it does is respond with the command back to you so that you know it's received the command. Right. Um, and then it'll answer, or you know, if, it's got a, if it's returning data, it replies with whatever command you did plus the data that you requested. So you can A, double check it's received the command correctly, and B, you know, you know that it's replying for that particular request. The, um, the command structure has a CRC checksum in it. If the unit receives a command that the CRC doesn't tell it, it just ignores it. Right. So, you know, it, it, it's not going to react. It's not going to respond to corrupted commands because um, it could then turn things off randomly that you don't want it to. Indeed, yeah. Um, again, something else not implemented, time server settings. Um, you know, there, there's been talk about data logging. We're not convinced that we're going to do data logging inside the unit. Um, well, you, just, you, you, you start getting into lots of flash memory then, yeah? Exactly. Yeah. So it's just there if we decide we need it. This last little box on the right-hand side, OLED timeout. The, the front panel display, as you've probably already described, has a OLED screen on that yes. can get lots of information. It times out after two minutes. Some people have said they want it set up for longer. I said when I've got them on an exhibition, I want it to be on all the time. So... Um, you can now set the timeout delay for the screen turning off from its default two minutes in multiples of 10 seconds. Um, if you set it to zero, then the timeout is disabled completely. Right. We don't advise that because, like all display technology, they have a, you know, a discrete lifespan. Yes. Yeah. So it's better to let it turn off when you're not using it. So yeah, that's pretty standard networky setup type stuff. If you change anything, you write the network settings to the unit, it uploads them back to the unit, they're held autonomously in the unit, and then you reset the Ethernet processor because the the data is saved in one of the PICs 
in the main, on the main board, not in the Ethernet pic. Right. Which means if you if for any reason you had to change the Ethernet board, it will it will remember all the settings that you had um, for it because it it reads them from one of the other picks in the unit. So because you mean the first as soon as power is stable and the Ethernet process is running, the first thing it does first is it does is yeah. go give me my network data. Well, give me lots of data actually. It reads lots of stuff um, so that it can then display it on the web browser interface. Um, so that's why the, you know, again, if the unit's remote, you don't want to have to go and press the front panel button. So that just resets the processor and forces it to refresh the data for reading out to the web browser. Fantastic. Uh, channel names. If I read the channel names, um, this is where you can program the names of what is on each outlet. Yes. Now, I, I'd, I'd not yet got around to that with ours, but, um, uh, you know, but, but this is great, yeah. Okay, that'll, it'll become clearer when we look at the web browser interface because that's displayed on the web browser interface. It's also displayed on the front panel OLED display. So if you're looking yes. at a channel outlet, it tells you what that channel outlet is actually running. Um, I guess I know it's written on the DESI strip if you've written the DESI strip, but it's just you know, for completeness, really. Oh, absolutely. Oh, that's, that's very powerful. So you should be able to tab through oh, VTR1 or you know, disk, disk array 5 or whatever. That's, that's very powerful. Yeah. Um, again, you write the channel names and then you reset the Ethernet processor again to reread those out. Macro triggers, the unit has built in macros. I'll come back to the triggers in a minute. If I click on edit macro, I'm now downloading the um, macro program that's in the unit um, here. As you can see on the DESI strip on the screen, I've got the names that I typed in. Uh, National Grid for the main supply, things like that. This is the macro programming language built into the units, which means basically you can program it to do what you want. The front panel switch is a soft switch. It's it's programmable, so it can do nothing, or it can run a sequence up, or it can. You know, it, it's entirely up to you. When they leave us, it sequences up. When you turn the front panel switch down, it sequences down. When you switch the front panel switch up, that's how it leaves us as by standard. There are also a couple of levels of load shedding and load dumping built into it. So as you can see here, we're, we're, the on-off switch is set when it's on, goes to memory location 1A, which is here. Turn on outlet 1 after half a second, skip if already on. Similarly, the on-off switch off interrupt is set to go to 2A, which is an off sequence. Right. I've also set up a couple of GPIs. The first GPI is a load shedding routine. So that typically could be triggered from a UPS's mains failure. Yes, relay. yeah. So it will trigger a pre-programmed load shedding routine that the longer the, um, the, um, the power is off, the more equipment is turned off in a controlled manner to keep the UPS running as long as possible. Um, the second GPI to interrupt goes to another level of, of load, well, it's actually a load dump routine, where that might be triggered by a low battery warning, for instance, yes. where you dump everything except a couple of outputs that you've got to keep going for as long as possible. So you've pre-programmed that all before the event even happens, yes. and the unit deals with it automatically. When GPI1 comes back, the high interrupt, it goes back to address 1A, which is the sequence on sequence, and it turns everything back on. So you know, once the mains has come back and the relay... Uh, okay, so once 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 the, the instruction at 1A is executed, it goes to 1B and then 1C, yeah? Yes, until it reaches a stop. A stop command, sure. Okay. I, I can actually demonstrate this because the unit is on at the moment. If I click trace on, yeah. it says, oh, well, I'm at memory location 24, and I happen... You know, that was the last thing it did, yeah? Was the last thing it did. Yeah. So if I say go to 2A, I think it was, go to... It's now running the sequence. Okay, and, and we can see we can see that, the, the LEDs. The sequence off, and you can see the LEDs sequencing off. And okay. I go to 1A and say go to. And you say it's, it's a mercy that neither your computer nor your router were attached to this power strip when you did that. Yes, no, in there, done that. Yes. <laughs> oh, I've turned it off and my screen's gone black. What do I do? No, I say I've, I've done that. Um, so I can demonstrate the... Um, 
I'm trying to remember what it was. So you, so you really can get your macros tight and good before you have to deploy them kind of thing. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. This is no. This is actually controlling a unit live. Yes. So what you're seeing, the LEDs on the on the screen, is reflective of the real. It's reflecting yeah. what the unit's doing. But you could it, you could do this at the workshop before you even take it to the customer's yeah. premises, kind of thing. Yeah. I've just switched the front panel switch. Of oh, I, have, I haven't turned trace on, but you can see that the LEDs are going off because I've actually I flicked the front panel switch on the the front of the unit. Yes. Yes. If I put trace back on. You can see I'm at the end of the, the off sequence. Yes. I'll flip the front panel switch back down again. And I'm now, now gone back to the on sequence. And there we go. Look at that. And so <laughs> the, 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 those two hex digits that show the position in, in memory, how, 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 how much space is there for storing stuff? It's um, 123 um, macro positions so it goes up to 7f or something like that is it it's, yes it's not quite all the way to um it, yeah it goes up to 7f you see you're very good at your yeah. hex <laughs> um but it starts at 10 right so it one zero i should say not 10 yes um but um yes there is the opportunity to input put extra memory in if people want extremely long macros there's a on the board there is a an eight pin dill socket that you can put memory in heavens uh, <laughs> I mean, you know this is a main nobody, unit <laughs> nobody has ever written macros that long sure um, as i was gonna say i was just going to demonstrate if i go to 3a right that's turned four outlets off straight away right now i've got a five second delay between each outlet and it's sequencing down um, but again that can be anything up to an hour and three quarters between relays actually but um, not that you'd ever probably want to do that long because your UPS wouldn't last that long. Um, and then just trigger back to 1A and it goes back to the sequence up. So, Okay, okay so all the, um, all, all the buttons you've got to the left-hand side of the, of the, um, of the live um, macro running window, um, yes. uh, 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 they're, they're all commands, are they? They're all commands. Yeah. If I scroll down to... I'm, I'm now at the end. I can, I can do things down here without affecting... If I turn auto increment on, and I set, say I want a five second delay, so you set five seconds into memory, so this, you yes. just click on these buttons, and that's, and it can be any sequence you like, yep. and I've written a, a sequence of on events, if you like. Yep. So that's, yeah, and the, similarly you can click the on button, and it will set set off command, but all of these are things that you can you can get it to do. So if I want to if I want to go to one A memory location on a GPI two low interrupt, right? I see. You go to GPI two low interrupt, click on that. So it says right GPI two is an input low interrupt. We'll go to address one A. Alternatively, if I actually want to set that to be an output. And I want it to be GPI2, GPI2 low output. I click on that button. So now it's changed the GPI to be an output, and it will go low when it reaches that memory location. Right, right. So whatever's in the sequence of, thi of this command sequence, it will do until it reaches the next stop. Yes, yes. Um, you've got a couple of counters in there. <laughs> you, can lo you can load a counter with a number and then decrement or in increment that number as part of your macro code. For instance, if, if your main supply goes, if your main supply disappears and then comes back and disappears and then comes back, you could say, well, actually, after the third time of it going away, I don't want to switch back to it. I just want to stay on the backup supply. Yes. Then you would load a counter and say, you know, when load it with three, each time the main supply disappears, you decrement the counter. Once it reaches zero, you say, actually, I'm never going to switch back. So you disable the, the switch back and things like that. So this is a changeover unit, as we've said. So you've got a changeover interrupt. So internally, if it, if it loses the main supply, goes to backup, you can trigger a macro on that event. You can trigger a different macro when it comes back. Okay, and, and how quickly uh, can you get things done? Uh, you know, when when uh, you know you lose an input. 
when you lose an input, it takes the changeover. It takes about fifteen milliseconds, a quarter of a cycle, okay, to detect the mains has gone. So Kit won't reckon, won't be aware of that, will it? It's not... And then it takes about another quarter of a cycle to actually change the relay over. Right. We've we've had this on all sorts of bits of kit. The most, the most. The bit of kit that dies the most on bad mains is usually set top boxes. And we've had these units driving set top boxes now and they don't even notice the mains has disappeared. Right, right. So, you know, it's 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 not, not been a problem. Uh, so anyway, once you've programmed your macro, you click the upload button, it uploads it to the unit, and then the unit remembers that forevermore. You so you don't need the computer to connect to it, it's it's completely autonomous um, once it's there. And um, I see there's a couple of buttons there: off limit main and off limit reserve. Off limit is that is that a is that a power draw or is it a current draw? Or no, no, that's no. that's the time. Um, the right. way that we, we detect mains failure is we're oversampling the mains a hundred times a second, so five hundred hertz. We detect we count the number of of counts where the mains is below a threshold. Right, which is on the. I'll demo. I can show you that a bit later. Here, it's about thirty-two counts. It's below a certain threshold, so you can set the um, the um, trigger point for it for the unit believing the mains has disappeared from within code. So what I was saying about decrementing the counter, if the main main supply disappears after three times the way the way you would stop it going back to the main supply is you would set the off limit main to be zero sure yeah so it says right well i haven't seen main i haven't seen any main i haven't sorry i'm now counting because the mains have disappeared it hasn't come back within zero counts therefore it's not there so you can you can make the unit believe the mains isn't on the main input even though it actually is right right so it's in the it's in the programming code for um so that you can set that within code you can set it manually as well but it's there so you can set it within code to disable the unit from using a particular supply and phase limit that sounds phase like a very limit, when when we once the main supply has disappeared and you go switch to backup supply when the main supply comes back as standard, we wait for 10 seconds for just to make sure the mains is really there and it's stable. And then we look compare the phase of the two supplies. And we don't change back to the main supply until the, until the backup supply is within 20 degrees phase of it. Right. So, you know, trying to avoid you know, changing when it's 180 degrees out of phase, for instance. Yes, which would upset well, most power supplies, wouldn't it? You think it would, but it doesn't seem to. Really, but, well, I can imagine linear supplies not being phased, uh, phased by it, not being fussed by it. But uh, but but a switching yeah. supply, you think, would be upset by that, wouldn't it? Yeah, I don't. I don't. It doesn't seem to be the case. Right. Obviously, when we're changing, we always say that the two the two supplies need to be phase coherent when they're both there. So if it's a UPS, ideally, it needs to be locked to the the, the incoming mains, mm. so that the two supplies are in phase. Sorry, I didn't push do not disturb. <laughs> um, yeah, so we we like them to be phase coherent. So when the two supplies are there, they are in phase. If the main supply fails, it will switch to the backup supply, even if it's 180 degrees out of phase. It doesn't have a choice. Sure. We do have a choice when we're coming back in. Right. So we do know people that run these with two completely free running main supplies doesn't seem to be a problem. The problem we originally had, and one of the reasons the phase limit facility is there, is that we had somebody who said, oh yes, we've got two phase coherent supplies. Well, yes, they were in phase, but they, they were coherent, but they were, at, they were synced, but they were actually 30 degrees out of phase. So when, when it was trying to switch back from the main supply, it couldn't because it never got in within our 20 degree window. Right, right. So we had to make the window bigger to cope with their 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 backup their backup supply was locked, but it was thirty degrees out of phase. 
And again, that's one of the reasons that that, that is there. And that was the result, what, of a UPS or a generator? It was actually a generator. Right, okay. They, they had been told by the manufacturer that it would be locked it would be locked and in phase with the main supply when the main supply was there. We proved the manufacturer wrong. Right, right. <laughs> so, <laughs> Much to their chagrin, I'm sure. Well, indeed, absolutely. Yes, it was. Uh, they were slightly embarrassed, but there we go. Um, so yes, lots of things that you can set on and off. Um, they're all commands, as I say, and those are trigger points that will go to a particular memory location within the macro code. That, that's remarkably powerful, isn't it? And all this running inside your mains distribution unit. Incredible. All running inside a mains distribution unit. Hmm. So if I now close that, this becomes more obvious. Yes. Macro triggers. Here, I've set up macro trigger names and memory location, hmm. and I've enabled them for macro triggers that will appear in the web browser interface. Yes. So you then give the, the user of the web browser interface the ability to trigger these macros by clicking on a button. Yes. I'm not saying that these are particularly good macros for them to be triggering from a button, but they're the, they happen to be the macros that I've written um, in this particular unit. Now, the soft the soft power button on the front, if yes. you if you se obviously if you sequence up from the web interface, um, presumably you don't make any effort to have the button reflect that. No, I mean that would be nonsensical. The the LED on the front panel of the button will, it's a very good question actually, I need to check this. The LED that's on the switch of, of the front panel switch will flash when a macro is being run. Right. I'm not 100% certain what happens if the, if the switch is technically on and you've sequenced down, we'll try it in a minute and we can see what happens. Um, I, I suppose the important thing is it, it's the LEDs above the above the the, 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 um, the, the fuses. Above, yeah, the, above the fuses that is actually telling you what's going on. Mm. Absolutely. Um, so that's it. That's that's basically the TCP configuration software um, that allows you to set the unit up, um, and you can go in and change things with the, the in a unit that's in service. The one thing that if you if you radically alter the macros in that you change, particularly if you change things in the first few um, memory locations, setting up GPIs and things, you actually have to unpower the unit and repower it for those to be read. If, if you change a sequence in an already programmed macro sequence, if you change that macro sequence, then it will obviously read that because it knows the GPIs will still be sending it to the right memory location and it will just do what's in the memory location. Sure. But if you radically change the GPI settings right at the front, then it that does unfortunately mean a power down, power up to reread those. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. That that's you know very um, complete. You know. It's, uh, okay. What else do you want to do? So that's of TCP configuration. Going back to the Ethernet device, device discoverer, the unit that we've been looking at, IP address forty nine, is that one. Click on it once to highlight it. Click on it again. It will then open the browser. Oh, no. So all of the things that we set up in the TCP config, the the um, the unit name and the unit location. I happen to do Phil's blog iPower demo. Yep. Uh, in there, it's also repeated up here in the in the tab, um, and all of the names of the of the things that we've got plugged in um, are set up are read in here. So we're now looking at our live web browser demo. Uh, obviously, that's the, they're the dangerous ones, being able to turn it off from the web interface. But I'm obviously needed, you know. Well, indeed. I mean, you know, this is this is what people want. They want to be able to turn things on and off from a web browser interface. Hmm. It's one of the reasons we we are putting in the security settings because um, somebody could come across this accidentally on your network. Yeah. Um, and um, and start playing with things. Yeah. But, Hello, uh, what's this? Yeah. <laughs> what am I doing here? Yes, or something. So, so yes, they're, they're, as I say, we do plan to have some. Um, some uh, some security in there in the in the near future. So obviously on 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 the right hand side of the interface there above the live graph of of, of volts and current, um, yeah. uh, uh, because because it, where it says graph total that's highlighted in green. That's the graph we get to see at this moment, isn't it? The that's one that's no the one no 
No, the green, the green, because this is a changeover unit. No, no, no. I meant, I meant um, uh, in 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 the blue um, uh, back. Oh, this button piece. here. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Graph total. Yeah. Yes, that's the graph total. So that's the total graph. That's the graph of the total current through the unit. The voltage is always the voltage, because that's that's just there. This is the total current of all the bits of kit that are plugged in the unit. Wow, and that, that speaks of uh, of switching supplies, doesn't it? <laughs> an individual bit of kit. Yes. So if I look at my computer monitor. It takes about a second for all that data to come down because it's having to read, obviously, that graph data. There's quite a lot of data for it to download. So I'm now looking at the power supply that's in the ViewSonic computer monitor that I'm using that happens to be plugged into that. I can turn that off. So I've just turned off my, the other computer monitor. Um, oh, so that, that is a change you've done to the most recent firmware because previously, I think, you, you saw... The you least significant it's... bit sort of amplified up, didn't you? you know, just yes. the noise, yeah? People didn't like that, so we've, we've, we've turned that to... When it's off, we just flatline the graph. Right. You do get a burst of it as you turn something off. Hey, that's great. You get a sudden burst of things. Yeah. The reason is that we're, we're measuring the current through current transformers, and we can measure everything from one, from one, milliamp, up, one milliamp to 70 amps peak. Wow, wow. It's, we, we're doing that through a 24 bit A to D converter. 24 so bits, wow. That's a lot of dynamic range, isn't it? When it's, when it's reading noise and it's an auto ranging graph on the current, you, um, you do see the noise, basically. We don't do that on the total current, even if all of the outlets are off. So if I turn off those four outlets, what you get is the noise. We don't flat, flat line the total current. Yes, because uh, there might be something you actually want to look at that's very low, so we 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 leave that as live data, but on the individual channels, we just flatlined it because it looks prettier to be honest. So I suppose uh, having that resolution on on the current measurement means that well you obviously you've got an earth leakage measurement up there that 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 becomes possible to measure those those milliamps of of earth leakage and that is one milliamp of earth leakage. Right, right. We're actually looking at the the, the current graph of the earth leakage. At, uh, so well uh, within the requirements of the 17th edition, so that's good. <laughs> absolutely. So, yes, we're, we're not too bad at the moment. The reason that's green is because we're on a changeover unit, and um, it's showing green because that's, the, that's currently the, the main supply that we're using. Right. If I go and kill the, the main supply, I've now switched to the backup supply. And as you can see, the, the left-hand side of the... The screen is replicating my load shedding routine. Yes, um, and telling you that I'm actually sequencing down. Uh, and, and how long does the beep 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 run for? Sorry, the, we, we, was that was that beeping? Was that was that from the unit? Yeah. Could you hear the beeping? I could. Yeah, just faintly over your microphone. Yeah. The the beeping is um, the beeping will basically run until you reset the alarm. Right. Either by the front panel button, uh, well, only by the front panel button. There isn't actually a an alarm reset on the uh, the web browser interface. Oh, because somebody so, should really pay attention, yeah. Because somebody should have paid attention. Um, it's telling... Sorry, I'm facing away from my microphone. Well, That's I reset, fine. I shut the alarm up. Um, it's basically when you, when you walk into a room, it's telling you that something has happened. Mm. And you can look at the front, the, the main and backup supply front panel LEDs, and they'll be flashing if one of them has failed it will be flashing to say I had an alarm and the reason I had an alarm was that my backup supply failed. And then you reset that from the front, the front panel switch. Sure. Um, so there, you, can re you can do a reset via TCP. It's just not, it doesn't happen to be in there at the moment. Right, right. Um, as you can see, we're measuring lots of stuff. Obviously, the RMS voltage, the frequency of the mains, which happens to be the same in both because it's the same supply, the peak voltage, uh, the crest factor of the voltage, neutral earth volts. Right. You're always going to get a bit of neutral earth volts um, because of the you know, resistance of the cabling between you and the and the substation. Because I'm right in thinking that most... Uh, premises now, um, your Earth essentially has come from the substation, from the star point of, of, the, yes. of, of the neutral. Yes. Yeah. So you're going to get a bit of neutral Earth volts. 
what's important is actually if it disappears all of a sudden. Yes, that that's pretty indicative of... Neutral and Earth together, locally to you. And that's very bad. Yeah, for sure. You know, current carrying conductors and Earths. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's why we've got neutral Earth faults there. Earth leakage. Um, again, we demonstrated that before. We're reading Earth leakage. Um, I haven't got a, I've got a little demo plug with six milliamps of earth leakage that I plug in when I'm at exhibitions. It, it is accurate to a milliamp. So um, it's, um, it's uh, high resolution, I think is the right word I should be using. Yes, absolutely. Um, all of the same information replicated for the backup supply on a changeover unit. If it's a single inlet unit, that's obviously not there. So, for, so getting back to earth leakage, to, to measure that, you're obviously taking a, a reading on the live and on the return. Is, is that right? Yeah, basically the live and neutral cables go through one current transformer. So we're, we're, we're reading the difference, basically. Okay, so, so, so much like a, an RCD. Obviously, yeah. an RCD uses a, a thermo effect. This yeah. is actually making a measurement. Fantastic. It's making a measurement, yeah. Um, total current through the unit... The current's crest factor. Yeah. Uh, real and apparent power. Right, with the correct units as well. <laughs> with the correct units yeah. as well, absolutely. Um, the power factor of the current. And and this isn't current, but it's the DC offset of the main, the voltage. So that's DC on the mains? DC on the mains. Yes. Um, if you have a bit of kit, um, like a switch mode power supply, where one of the bridge rectifiers has died, it will, it, it will tend to put DC on the mains because it will start drawing more current from one side of the waveform than the other, the positive or the negative. So you can see that we've got slightly flat top voltage here. Yes. It seems to, you know, it's, generally, you get flat topped mains. Um, that, that's all over London and everywhere, isn't because, it? Because that's where the current is being drawn. Yes. As you can see from the current graph, it's being drawn at that particular point. Um, if you start drawing current from more than one side, more from the top above the line than below the line, you will tend to offset the mains and therefore get a DC component in it. This is not good for linear power supplies and transformers because yes. it makes them saturate really badly. Um, and that causes them to hum, which I'm sure everybody's heard. I'm sure it causes additional heating effects as well, and, does it? And, and, heat, and they yeah. causes them to overheat as well. So, um, yes, it's uh, another reason, again, one of the reasons we measure it, um, because it's actually an important thing to look at. Um, so that's that. You can see down here we've got internal temperature of the mains unit. We've got external temperature and external humidity. That's a, a, a Dallas one-wire interface. Right. So by little modules with temperature and humidity sensors in, you plug it in and it reports that back. They're, they're quite common, those sort of environmental modules for sort of server room monitoring and things like that, aren't they? I've, yes. I'm sure yes. I've seen those, yeah. And you know, people's home weather stations are all done using Dallas one wire type stuff. Right. Because it actually, well, it uses two wires. It uses a, a conductor that does, has volts and data and a ground. Right. Uh, so it charges up the capacitor in the, in the sensor and then turns the power off and quickly reads the data and then turns the power back on to charge the capacitor up again. Um, oh, oh, right, okay, yeah. Clever little device. Yeah. Um, the other thing we talked about was macro triggers. Switch to another tab. So now you can see that the, the macro triggers that we set up are here. So again, I can click on there and I can trigger the sequence down. And on the left-hand side, you can see it sequencing down. Yeah, I can actually hear the release ticking. <laughs> Fantastic. And then turning back on again. So the other the other important bit to demo, which I should have done before I switched to macro triggers, is if I switch to the graph of this particular unit. This is a linear power supply in a box. Right. As you can see, we're drawing eight point six watts, eight eight and a half, eight point six watts. Lots of people say they 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 measure the the power being taken by a bit of kit on an output so they can see if that power changes because the power supply and the bit of kit plugged in is going faulty. We measure down to the 0.1 of a watt. Most people only measure to the nearest watt. Sure. 
So my demonstration is, is I've got a, this little demo box I've got. I'm going to change the value of the capacitor in the power supply. Well, all that's happened is that I've increased to 8.8 .8 watts. So I've gone up 0.3 of a watt. Yes. Not really a lot. Wouldn't trigger on something that's measuring to the nearest watt. Very noticeable on the waveform there. Yeah. What's changed is the shape of this waveform. Similarly, if I short out one of the diodes in the bridge rectifier, I'm still only taking 9.1 .1 watts. Nine yes, watts. but, but all, all in the second half of the cycle. Yeah. But you've got a really nasty waveform there. Yeah. I won't leave on too long because it'll do something nasty. The point is, is that you can't tell what's going on from that information. Yes, yes. You need to be able to actually see the graph to tell that there's anything different. Because all, I mean, all that, all that, all that power figure is, is, is it's an expression of, of, of heat, really, isn't it? It's, it's, it's a, yeah. an equivalent heat load. Yes, absolutely. So. When we started designing this, when, you know, from very early days, we put a graph into the into the display because you need to be able to see that to know what's going on. You know whether anybody is actually going to you know, take take a snapshot of the graph when they put a bit of kit in and then go back after six months and see whether it's changed or not. Who knows? But. I bet people get very used to you know once once you've got a few of these in your facility and yeah. you know you're making a habit of looking at them occasionally you must get a real feel for for what what waveforms you're expecting. Absolutely, yes. Um, but the you know all of that data is available externally. Um, we're obviously drawing it out to put in our in our in our um, web browser interface, but it's equally available as a um, data string in the TCP conversation. So you can take that that current data out. Map it yourself, graph it yourself on something. So you've got a sort of a documented API for for how somebody wants to to, to, to produce their own bit of software could. Absolutely, yes. Right. That's what well, I say. It's exactly what Telenor are doing. They're using the data miner right. uh, program. So they've had the, had the API. They're they're writing a a module for it at the moment um, for controlling it using data miner, and that's freely available to anybody that wants it. Okay. Okay. So. I think that's about it, really. Well, so I notice I notice you're measuring the the, the, the frequency um, to you know a, a percent of a of a hertz. That's yes. rather splendid, isn't it? I mean, we're just slightly below fifty hertz at the moment, um, and I, I noticed it peak up up just slightly above fifty hertz before. And yeah. I think I, I, it, it doesn't law mandate that on, on average it has to be fifty hertz. Pretty damn close. No, it has to be fifty. It has to be on average. 50 hertz. But over how long? A, over a 24 hour period. Over 24 hours? Wow, that's quite a big window. So, then. The, the, so, so if it goes too fast at one point, it has to slow down at another point so that over 24 hours it was average 50 hertz. So that all mains driven clocks stay in time. Yes, I mean, there can't be too many of those anymore, can there? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sure they're fine. Actually, the frequency can vary. I, I'm not, I can't actually remember what it is, but it's more than a hertz. Um, really, really, okay. It's allowed to vary, yes, absolutely. Okay. I know when I when on the odd occasion I keep an eye on it, and I think the National Grid have a website where where they'll show you, you know, how much power Britain's drawing at this moment and what, and what the frequency is, and it's when, always pretty damn close to fifty. When everybody turns their kettle on at the half time in a football match, yes, it'll slow down because well, yeah, because all those generators will be a tiny bit more loaded, and oh, I've got to generate lots more power, so. Um, they tend to slow down a little bit. So, but as I say, they have to keep it to within 50 hertz over 24 hours. Now, have we ever had this conversation about when I was doing training at the um, the Mets uh, training facility in? in no, I, I think we might have done, and I've read about it subsequent to that. Yes, yeah, so, so they, they they do this whole thing of, of network frequency analysis for, for for marking audio recordings. Yes, <laughs> staggering, really. Quite a fascinating. Uh, fascinating thing okay well, hey, I hope, uh, hope that wasn't too boring no that was really kind Simon thank you for, for, for that put, put your camera back on so uh, so we can see you uh, I've got to work out how uh, <laughs> oh a, a fellow LastPass user oh yes all the time fantastic nicely out of sync again <laughs> <laughs> no it's, it's all good okay so um uh, it, it seems that every time I've seen you at a trade show over the last probably four years, 
um, you know, iPad has been in development. What's what, what? What are the? You know, how many how many people are you selling it to, and how how, how well is it going down? And and it's so- it's going extremely well. It's it's been in development a long time because we've had lots of hurdles to negotiate. Um, and not you know, one of our raison d'etre at Bryant is if we're going to do something, we do it properly. Yes. So we have read the safety standard BSEN 60950 back to front, front to back, upside down, inside out. And we believe we conform to the standard. We've looked at numerous products made by uh, competitors, I suppose is the word, and every one of them you can find fault in the safety standard. We, you know, we went to EMC testing with our first design. It failed dismally. We had to go back and start again. And was that because of emissions coming out of the mains cabling, or what? what? It's emissions. It worked perfectly when you had no outlet cables plugged in. Right. As soon as you plugged an outlet cable in, it turned into a transmitter. Right. So we had to go back and redesign it. All went surface mount with lots of suppression caps everywhere and things. And now it passes. I can't remember which the standard is but it passes in the most difficult fashion in that it's, it's um, emissions is to the domestic standard and Im- immunity is to the in- heavy industrial standard. Right. So, you know, it doesn't give anything out and it doesn't get affected by anything either. So, you know, we and, but it all takes time and effort and it's been a hard slog. Um, and yes, we've been... We've been demoing it, I think, about four years now at IBC and other exhibitions. And every time we've been there, we've had discussions with people about X, Y, and Z, and thought, "Oh, actually, yeah, we need to think about that." And it's all gone into the into the development brain. Um, and uh, the iPower, as you see it today, is what's come out the other end. And it seems very much like a platform, the kind of thing that that Absolutely, that's kind yeah. of going to build and lead you forward. There's lots of things that we could do in it. Um, you know, we talked about having alarms on upper and lower current level trigger levels on each outlet and things. Well, if somebody wants that, then yes, we can do it. Right. We don't at the moment because nobody's actually asked us. Um, people want, you know, people have asked about SNMP. It doesn't have SNMP. Um, the two people that asked about SNMP when we said, well, it doesn't do SNMP yet, but we do TCP. They went, oh, fine, that's even better. So they're doing it TCP. Um, you know, yes, we'll do SNMP. If somebody you know, wants to buy hundreds of them and and they've got to have SNMP, then then that's what we'll have to get on with it. But um, it's 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 going to be a bit demand led at the moment. Sure, but I suppose as as you know needs become obvious and people pay for those things to be developed in, it kind of becomes available, doesn't it? To the I don't necessarily think that they would need to pay. They would need to make a commitment to buy some. Right. You know, we're not we're not going to put something in if they only want to buy one. Yeah. But if you know, if somebody comes along and says, "Look, you know, we really like these, and we, you know, we might want fifty of the things for this particular installation, but it needs to do this," then yes, is the answer. If we can do it physically and technically, we will do it. Um, it just really depends what they want it to do. Um, well, I mean, that is great. As I said, I've 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 really enjoyed seeing it kind of coming along. You know, IBC and BV and places like that, and. Um, you know, I'm about to drop our first two into our server room, uh, and that's really because our, our IT guy often needs to be able to power cycle things. He doesn't like coming in from home. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, long may it continue. <laughs> so the one thing that I didn't show you, if you've got another couple of minutes. Yeah. Um, I know we've... You, can you see that screen now? Yes, indeed. I know we've discussed this before, but I'm just showing it here talking about the, the reason for having the graph. Yes. This is a unit that is in, it being used live in the European Commission in Brussels, um, in one of the big conference rooms with the big circular table and all the MEPs and simultaneous translation booths around the outside. And they're powering all of their AV gear in the control rooms with our mains units. And this is the voltage and current waveform that they currently have. Well, that voltage doesn't look anything like a sine wave to me. <laughs> no, indeed. And, and the current is very weird. 
Yes, uh, whether well, there's a there's a big old harmonic on top of there. Well, indeed, yes, actually, yeah. it's about 100 hertz. What we think is happening, we haven't, um, or the chap at the EC hasn't got to the bottom of it yet. The rooms that he has have a big isolation transformer on their input, which technically you shouldn't do, but they have. He inherited that. We didn't have a choice. And we think that he's being supplied by a big UPS. And the UPS is spending all of its time trying to keep the sine wave a sine wave on the voltage. But because of the big inductor in the way, in the way of the, current, the, the isolation transformer, its feedback loop is corrupted. So it's constantly working away, trying to make the, uh, the voltage a sine wave and failing dismally because it's overcompensating. By the time it's, it's done a bit of compensation, it's changed because of the, the, uh, the feedback loop. Or because of the phase or because of the error phase. that's been induced by this big isolation transformer. Transformer. Right. You wouldn't know that if you didn't have that graph. Sure, sure. And, and when we talk, when when because we said to him, could we have a screen grab of something, you know, real world use of a mains unit? And he said, yes, he sent it to us and here it, this is what he sent us. And we said, we went back to him and said, are you sure we want you to, to be able to show this and put your name to it? <laughs> and he said, no, absolutely. It's why I bought your mains unit. Right. Because I wanted to be able to see that. And now that I've seen it, I need to go and figure out what to do about it. But if I hadn't had your mains unit, I wouldn't have known about it, other than buying a you know, four and a half thousand pound mains analyzer. Yes, yes. Uh, and presumably his UPS wasn't wasn't telling him I'm having to hunt the whole time to try no, and track this. No. Yeah, absolutely. So it, it, you know, that uh, that was entirely the reason that we uh, that, that he bought them was because of the ability to show that graph. So that's pretty compelling, isn't it? Absolutely. So. Uh, there we go, and, and you lost some resolution, but that's fine. Okay, well, listen, Simon, thank you so much for that. That's really no appreciated. That's okay. Um, be interested to see the final, um, the I, final version. I shall ping you a YouTube link before I make it public, and you can tell me what you think. No worries. Jolly good. I'll good, see. Mate. I'll see you soon, chap. Thanks a lot. Time to go to the pub. <laughs> <laughs> on a school night <laughs> oh, mine, mine are too old for that now 26 and 22 I don't, I don't have to worry about school nights anymore yeah, well they're, they're taking you to the pub now <laughs> indeed absolutely cheers okay. Phil I'll see you soon bye bye